Hello? Yes. Hello, everybody. So, move fast and break things. That's a popular startup bus quote that you can hear all over the startup scene. And it's coined by Facebook co-founder Mark Zuckerberg. You know the guy who has that web page that you share cat photos on? Uh, the full quote reads, move fast and break things. Unless you're breaking stuff, you're not moving fast enough. And this really captures the essence of being a startup where you have to test your assumptions all the time. Uh, and even though Facebook has since changed their motto, it still can be found everywhere. So here you can buy a pillow with it on if you want to. And in Facebook's case, it's not that strange that they chose the move fast and break things because their stack was PHP <laughs> and uh, JavaScript. Like, what's even going on here? So the only alternative for them would have been to move slow and still break things. <laughs> but I'm here today to talk about a different way of doing stuff, and it's move fast and don't break things, which seems like a much better proposal to me. And it's how we ran a startup using Elm. Uh, my name is Nils Eriksson, and I'm currently a front-end developer at Mirado Consulting in Stockholm. Awesome consulting firm, pretty small. So if you're into enjoying what you're working with, then uh, you can come and pay us a visit. Uh, but before I did that and was a serious employee, I lived in this trash bin. And it's me there in the corner, and you could find me there from hours, name any hour. Uh, to another hour. And what we were trying to build was uh, the following. It's a site where you can explore information across the globe, and you can see where stuff is happening, and interesting information grows, and it's a grassroots approach to information uh, filtering. Uh, but uh, when I joined the startup, there was already a previous effort into creating this. And uh, that really had grinded to a halt. It was built uh, with backbone by one person. And we could like spend the entire week and then get nothing done because it was so hard to see how everything fit together. So we were thinking about the full rewrite. And luckily for us, there's a lot of frameworks going around. You just have to pick the right one for this week, and uh, I was into Angular at that time. I can't really remember why now, but <laughs> React was pretty popular. This was like 2015, the end of 2015, and you really got the feeling that you were supposed to rewrite your front end every six weeks uh, at that point. And people in the community were complaining about JavaScript fatigue, which is just the fancy word of being ungrateful for free stuff that people make for you. So, <laughs> uh, but all of this is like band-aid on a fundamental problem, and it's the language itself. So we try to like think: Can we leave JavaScript behind and find something better? So we started looking into compile to JavaScript languages, uh, and one that really caught our eye was. Uh, Elm. It's a delightful language for reliable web apps. It has both delightful and reliable in the same sentence. So it has to be good, right? So we also had a second agenda, really, because we had to graduate, but we still wanted to work on our startup. So Elm being a functional language was super suited to write a thesis. And uh, our thesis is called Elmulating JavaScript. And basically, you can summarize it in one one page. <laughs> it's like, what do you need to get the same things in JavaScript as you can get in Elm? So the first two, pure functions and high order functions, those are both native to JavaScript. But then if you want immutable data structures, then you will have to use immutable yes or mori, currying, if you want it in a nice way, you use Ramda, static type checking, flow. If you don't like null, like, why would you? Then uh, you can use data.maybe. If you want the fancy architecture, similar to the one that Elm uses, you can use Redux. 
and declarative UI, React.js, or Angular 2 these days, I guess, uh, or 3 or 4 or 5, I don't know <laughs> which one they're on. Uh, and that this time there's also like a streaming library, because this was 0 0.16. And there's arguments to be made for including uh, Webpack and Babel into this as well. But when you get all this stuff, I mean, I'm already tired reading them, like you have to cram that all into one application. <laughs> and you will try to work with that. And there's sti stuff will stick out uh, in the end. So with Elm instead, like you get everything in the one. <laughs> and it's a great experience. So since we were building a greenfield application here, like starting from zero lines of code, it really came down to an epic battle between Elm and then it's surrounded by the huge React uh, community here. Like, I see that Elm is the bad guy here, but uh, not really. Uh, it's just like Darth Maul, it was misunderstood uh, and people, uh, he has just bad hair. And uh, <laughs> at the time, many people were complaining about compiled to JavaScript languages, I felt at least. Now it's more mainstream. So to compare these two, we built the same project twice. Uh, one with Elm and one with React. And after building those two projects, we came to like, some conclusions to why we would want to build in Elm. So the first one being, it's hard to write terrible code. In uh, React, it works really well as long as you behave, but you can always shoot yourself in the foot. And if you get that one coworker that like, starts binding to window and doing crazy stuff, there's nothing there to stop him or her. Uh, so that was really appealing to us, that uh, there was very hard to hack, because uh, yeah, we were kind of intermediate programmers. I'll get to that. Uh, fast and safe iteration. So being a startup, we don't really know what to build. We have to do it fast, or we're going to end up on the streets. So uh, when we built those two projects, we really felt like oh, Elm really helps us in this regard. You're not, at, you're not afraid at all to, uh, to iterate and refactor and change stuff, because the compiler is there and holding your back. It's helpful for intermediate programmers. We knew that the more decisions we had to make, the more chance for error. So in Elm, there's like a fixed way of doing a lot of stuff. And uh, so as long as we don't take the decisions, we, we trust that Evan more than our own <laughs> abilities, because you'll get into hairy situations. Uh, Elm makes you a better programmer. Sure, we were intermediate then, but we wanted to graduate to wizards at some point. So we thought that Elm would be, from a personal perspective, pretty good to try out functional programming, which was new to us at the time, and like expand our knowledge. And then when we worked on non-Elm stuff, because you can't always do that, we would make a better job. So the Elm compiler, it was really like mind-opening for us. Uh, high opening. <laughs> uh, so have the compiler that was like kind to you and patted your back when you made mistakes. So I guess you've all seen these, but it can find uh, like spelling mistakes that could take you a long time otherwise to find. And it's really good for me that's being dyslectic to have this. They, all my everything is spelled wrong in the same way, so that's good. Uh, <laughs> Also, it makes you not miss any cases that you would otherwise not consider. And that's always like when you do something in Elm, and it's like, oh, do this. I'm like, oh, I would never thought of that otherwise. So that was really good. And I really wish they would take this to the next level, where it not only helps you when, it, when you're making mistakes, but it would like edge you on as you code, or like, oh, I saw you did a nice refactor there. You saved 300 lines of code. Or have you considered this? You're using this function here, but you can really make it into one here, uh, something like that. That would be cool. Uh, and then Elm format. Now we worked with a language where it had an auto formatter that everybody used. And if you've used uh, JavaScript lately, there's Pritter now. That's similarly awesome. 
really thanks to that. Uh, but uh, the thing, the formatter com uh, combined with the architecture really made it so we could read other people's code in a way we never could otherwise, and you don't have to spend a lot of time thinking about uh, or discussing how, oh, two or four spaces or stuff like that, which is just a waste of time. We just want to build our product. So the Elm architecture was also something that we looked at and said, okay, this is good, let's use it. And Redux was like coming to the de facto standard in uh, React as well, and it's basically just the port of it. So we really trusted the architecture, and that also makes it so that you can read other people's code. So that's really good. Easier to hire great talent. So Elm, just like Python used to be, if somebody comes to you and they know Elm or some other niche thing, they have sorted out by interest, and that already is like a really good filter for applicants if you're looking for somebody to work with. But also, like, in the, there's so many startups. Like, I just moved to Stockholm, and there's like <laughs> one every meter that you fall over. And um, offering to work with something interesting can really be uh, like a big uh, benefit when you're competing on that market. So Elm is fast. This wasn't really that important. It was just like, okay, so what's the cost of all these great things that we can do? But it turns out it's no, not really a cost. It's actually really fast. So another thing we considered was publicity. Like when we joined, the Slack channel had like 800 people, and now it's 8,000. So we thought, oh, if we build a cool application with Elm and make it bigger than no red inks, <laughs> then the people's going to want to know how we did it, and we can write a blog post about how we did that, and uh, yeah, I wonder how that can work out. So <laughs> that's what we thought. So if I summarize it all, it's here. It's hard to write terrible code, fast and safe iteration, helpful for intermediate programmers, it makes you a better programmer, and the compiler, the architecture, and the formatter is really good, easier to hire good talent, and it's fast and we could get publicity. So fast forward three months, and we wrote 30,000 lines of code. And uh, if we look back on what we thought could be good, like, was it? So the first one, it's hard to write terrible code. It's true, but it's still possible. <laughs> <laughs> we managed. <laughs> I mean. We needed even more tight restrictions on what we could do. But uh, for the most part, we kept away from that. Fast and safe iteration. This was really true. Like, we could get PRs that was the half the code base, and like, oh, it compiles, then just ship it. Uh, if you would have something else, and somebody would do that, you would not be able to sleep at night as well, I think. So helpful for intermediate programmers. This was sort of true. It was true for all the parts that was already ironed out, but this was pretty early, so some of the stuff hadn't really been done. And then we as intermediate programmers had to think about, oh, how do you do this? How do you actually talk from a child upwards? And nobody was, like, everybody was scratching their head, and we're like, we have to build this now. And uh, that, uh, that was kind of hard, but also interesting. But uh, we were kind of off the mark a bit there. Uh, makes a better programmer. Yeah, I really feel... It has. Uh, you think about the problem in a different way, so it's been super beneficial. The compiler, the formatter, and the architecture, it really worked out well. And the architecture, it was interesting, like after six or eight thousand lines of code, like the complexity in the, in the app didn't get any higher. It's, it really didn't feel that there were any, was any harder to work with it or anything like that. So that's really a testament to uh, that it's a good model, we think. Uh, the compiler we did have some issues with, and I will get into them uh, in another slide. Uh, easier to hire good talent. We didn't really look for people, but they emailed us, so that's probably good. Uh, it's fast. Yeah, we did like one optimization, I think. Uh, and publicity, yeah, it kind of worked out because I'm standing here, right? So <laughs> I think we're right on that mark. 
So there's some objections towards using Elm, which I don't really agree with. And the first one being, it's not a stable release. And sure, it sounds bad in, if you just look at it like that, but you can't look at it in a vacuum. It's like, how often does it break? And if it breaks, how hard is it to upgrade? And I haven't found it hard at all to upgrade. Like the last release you can upgrade automatically, and the one before that was also like a manual process. And the thing about upgrading is that when you've done, you know that you have done it the correct way. And that's the most important part. If you have like 50,000 lines of Angular, and you're supposed to update that, and like, okay, I'm, I think I'm done now. How do I follow all the steps? And then you just, okay, <laughs> you leave it out there, and then you see red things in the console. So I don't think that's a serious consideration, really. It's more like, what are you getting? I'd rather get something unstable that's easy to update than something stable. I don't know. Show me a stable JavaScript project. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it, the term doesn't exist. And it's easy to upgrade. That's more up important. And then, like, this one. Well, people don't know Elm, so if you're doing this as a consultant, then who's going who's gonna to keep working on it? Like, Learning Elm is not harder than learning any other framework. And I look at Elm that way more than like a language. It's more like a framework with some syntax on top of it. And it makes you do things in a certain way. So you can always learn. And if people can't learn, you don't, probably don't want to hire them anyway. And um, the thing, if you're not thinking super, super short term, it's not correct either, because if you spend three weeks on teaching yourself how to do Elm, and then you keep working, you're going to surpass the ones that didn't learn it, because you will have a higher velocity as you keep working. So if it's super short term, fine, but otherwise, no. So some problems that we had. The first one, we were pretty dependent on the community. And uh, luckily for us, the community is pretty awesome. So if I have JavaScript questions, I go there to random and I get answers. But I don't at <laughs> JavaScript, uh, real JavaScript slacks. So we were pretty dependent on them. Like also, people, we needed people to build libraries for us that we couldn't build because we weren't good enough. But in the end, it worked out really well. So. But it was just something that we had in the back of our mind. Uh, the compiler stopped working. Not stopped working, that's pretty hard, but like it, it cached too heavy. So if I change something here, and I know it's going to break over here, and it doesn't, then you start losing faith. And then you have to delete the cache and rebuild every time. And that took like two minutes. So in the, in the end, like, it got really, really slow. But this was 0 0.17, so in 0 0.18, it's supposed to be solved. So, uh, but that was something that got kind of annoying for us. And then our own fault, we're like working against the paradigms, but it wasn't really, there weren't really a sort of or definitive guide on how to do stuff. So if we had to make our own decisions, yeah, then stuff didn't work out that well. Um, so some considerations when not to use Elm, because it might not fit every use case. Uh, yeah, it does. Because <laughs> I actually had one thing there when I beta tested this talk, and it was rapid prototyping. But after the talk, he came to me like, oh, I use it for that all the time. So I was like, OK, whatever. <laughs> Probably works. So thank you. That's all for me. And if you want to ask questions, feel free to do that afterwards, because I think I'm all out of time. So that's all. Thank you. <laughs>